Good morning, afternoon and evening from wherever you might be listening from. My name is Martin Mel. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Osaka University in Japan. And today's presentation is about surge and wave conditions under warmer ice-free Arctic Ocean. This study is part of an ongoing research and talks about some of the results and experiences of doing numerical studies in the Arctic. In recent years, the Arctic has been gaining increasing attention as a system where the climate change effects are shaping the region much faster than the global average. The process known as Arctic amplification continues to decrease the summer sea ice extent, leaving the waters ice-free for longer periods of time, thus resulting in more energetic sea state, which among other changes further contributes to rapid coastal erosions within the ocean basin. The general consensus from various historical and future studies show that swells are becoming more prevalent and there is a projected increase in wave heights. While these studies focus on studying satellite and various global climate model outputs, there is little focus on individual extreme Arctic storm events, also known as polar lows or extratropical cyclones. What will happen with such storms? Will they become stronger, weaker, more intense or something else? And if the sea ice in the summer months are gone, then what are the likely impacts of such storms? The current study aims to address such questions by looking at storms under future climate conditions around the mid 21st century. The study aims to have both regional and local perspective. For local study area, the port hamlet Tuktoyotuk was chosen, being the largest permanent settlement in the Northwest Territories in Canada. The hamlet has been struggling with rapid coastal erosion issues for years due to a combination of climate change effects and over the years, the issues have become more serious. However, due to its remote area, long and complex coastline, adequate protective measures have been economically hard to come by. Therefore, the community has mostly relied on makeshift protective measures to bolster the coastline. Yet, unfortunately, these solutions have had temporary effect. One of the more successful solutions, however, is the 100 meters of concrete slabs, as shown in figures one and two. For modeling and hindcasting casting individual extreme storm events, it was necessary to find such storms first. In Tuktoyotuk, there is one weather station and a tide cage. However, due to difficulties in operating equipment in the Arctic, no long-term observations are available, and the few longer data time series that do exist are more than often plagued with uncertainties and have long gaps in measurement recordings as seen in Figure 3. The second option was to use local hindcast product known as Beaufort MSCV. While also a model data, it is not ideal. However, it should give a good indication to the historical sea state in the vicinity of Tuktoyotuk. And from that data, the 1999 September storm was chosen as a storm event for the current study, where the Beaufort MSCB shows around 2 meter sea level and significant wave heights during the storm's peak. For hindcasting and future simulations, the study used the well-established open source models, WRF for meteorological modeling and EPICOMS wave for ocean modeling. However, for the WRF in this study, the polar optimized version was used, known as PWRF or polar WRF, that through optimization schemes ought to be more suitable for polar areas. For ocean modeling, the EPICOMS wave was used, which is coupled with the unstructured surface wave model S wave. The general flow of steps and processes can be seen in Figure 5, where the historical simulations or hind casting were conducted first in order to verify the modeling step accuracy, followed by the future scenario simulations. For future scenarios, as mentioned earlier, the target year was 2050. For this, 14 general circulation model ensemble was used, and from those GCMs, the main parameters taken were the sea surface temperature, atmospheric air temperature, and relative humidity. The polar WRF simulation covered the entire Arctic Ocean and beyond that. The resolution was downscaled to 20 kilometers from the CFSR reanalysis data, from which the wind and pressure fields from this parent domain were used to force the regional epical mess wave simulations. The second domain was downscaled to 4 kilometers covering the Beaufort Sea. The wind and pressure fields from here were used to force the local epical S wave simulations where these results were used to look at the wave and sea level conditions in and around Tuktoyotuk. For Epicom S wave, four different computational domains were created. First, the SD, or small domains were used only in the Canadian Beaufort, where the hindcast domains had the presence of sea ice and the two RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 scenarios were without the sea ice. The same applied for regional modeling, which included most of the Arctic Ocean. 
The modeling domains are shown in the next slide. Here are the four different Epico S-Wave computational domains. The Heinke scenarios can be seen on the left, where the upper one covers the regional domain and the bottom one local Beaufort domain. The same applies for the future scenarios to the right. In the Heinkest domains, the presence of sea ice is shown in grayscale, and in the September of 1999, the sea ice extent was over 6 million square kilometers in the Arctic Ocean. For the larger Arctic Heinkest domain, only one open boundary was used in the Chukchi Sea that separates the Eurasian and North American continents. This was because the sea ice was landlocked in most of the Canadian archipelago and in the Russian Siberia. In future scenarios, there was no sea ice, and a total of 10 open boundaries were used. For the smaller Beaufort domain, in both Heinck Hasting and future scenarios, three open boundaries were used. The study used the ensemble of 14 GCMs, where the future minus control period monthly parameter values were interpolated to the Heinkast scenario meteorological grids, and subsequently acting as the new 2050 RCP 4.5 and 2050 RCP 8.5 future scenarios that then were rerun with the Polo WRF. The individual GCM and ensemble results for the three selected parameters can be seen in figure 8. The most notable takeaway from the individual GCMs is the large variability among the model outputs. This further shows the need to consider the ensemble approach in such sensitivity studies to reduce the degree of uncertainty that might otherwise come from just using a single model. Here are the polar WRF results from the parent domain covering the Arctic Ocean and its surroundings. The Heinkast and future RCP scenario images show the pressure and wind fields during the 25th of September at 10 UTC time step, when the storm system was most active around the Canadian Beaufort, as indicated by the dashed red circles. The region is dominated by high and low pressure systems, and from future scenarios no definitive changes can be observed. However, for the RCP 8.5 scenario, the Arctic storm seems to have a weaker concentrated wind band along the continental shelf. For regional simulations such as these, it is difficult to determine the accuracy of the storm track and its meteorological fields in the Arctic. Therefore, the main purpose in this study is directly comparing the future scenarios with that of the Heinkast in order to determine direct changes brought by the three parameter changes. The regional wave fields under Heinkast scenario show the vast area covered by the sea ice, and the red X mark shows the location of Tuktoyotuk. Under future scenarios where there is no sea ice, the vast Arctic Ocean leaves large stretches of the water open to potentially increased surge and wave attack along the coastlines. However, the 1999 September storm in this study moves along the continental shelf from the USA towards Canada and its archipelago system. In that sense, the full potential of lack of sea ice under storm conditions is not observed in this case study. However, looking at the future scenarios, both of the scenarios show mixed results, where the RCP 4.5 has larger spatial significant wave height coverage, whereas the RCP 8.5 shows slightly more distributed higher wave fields around the Canadian archipelago. Aside from the regional look, the main aim was to see the storm results in Tuktoyotuk as mentioned earlier. Since Tuktoyotuk has a weather station and the data was mostly present during the study period, the simulated wind fields could be compared against the observations. For the most part, the high cast and observations follow the same curve, with the exception in the early stages of the time series. At both tails, it can be seen that the wind speed is strongly underestimated, ranging from around anywhere from 2 to 7 meters per second, and the observed wind direction is from the west, which better connects the Dukdera to Bay Area to Beaufort Sea and thus leads to potentially higher surge and wave setup. Weaker synoptic events in a complex coastal area, as is the case here, can however lead to potential inaccuracies in ocean modeling. The future results, on the other hand, also show mixed results as was seen for the regional case. Interestingly, in Tuktoyotuk, the RCP 8.5 scenario follows the Heinkast curve quite similarly. However, the RCP 4.5 shows large deviations compared to the Heinkast and RCP 8.5. 
Since there was no tight or wave gauge data to be used in the area, these results are merely hindcast versus future scenario comparisons to see the wave and surge response. In contrast to wind field differences, the surge and significant wave height response was less pronounced. Where the surge peak fluctuated around 0.5 meter mark, at significant wave height around 0.5 to 0.7 meter mark. The RCP 4.5 scenario showed the largest response to significant wave height, which was likely contributed by the slightly higher wind speeds from the west-northwest direction. Compared to the Beaufort MSCB, these results are strongly underestimated. The main reasoning for this is likely in simulated wind field and bathymetry quality as well as in tidal considerations. However, it is still difficult to assess whether how accurate the Beaufort MSCB itself is as a reference source for such considerations. Significant wave height spatial distributions in the Canadian Beaufort follow more closely that of the regional simulations. The peak values range from 4 to 4.5 meters. Looking at these results, it can also be seen that reaching 2 meter significant wave height in the Kukmalik Bay, where Tuktoyatuk is situated, is rather difficult at least with the current setup. As for the future scenarios, the RCP 4.5 has slightly wider area of influence due to the lack of sea ice presence. And in contrast, the RCP 8.5 is less concentrated but has large area spread of high wave fields. Based on the ongoing climatic changes in the Arctic system, it is highly likely that the sea ice continues to decrease further on a yearly basis leaving the coastal areas open to longer periods of high wave and surge conditions during the warmer half of the year. From the current ongoing study, the modeling results remain uncertain. The biggest issues for modeling studies here lie in the quality data for observations and also in topography and bathymetry for higher resolution domains around the complex coastal areas. It is also necessary to improve the downscale weather simulations to capture such events with higher precision. The future 2050 RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 scenario studies showed mixed results. Based on a single storm study, it is hard to derive concrete conclusions. However, in both scenarios, changes were observed. With that in mind, there is a need to increase these storm studies in order to reduce uncertainty and get more definitive conclusions. And here are the references. Thank you for taking your time and coming to listen to today's presentation.